Well, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. It's uh, July the 17th, July the 17th, and we praise God for another chance and another opportunity to come uh, one more time with the virtual Bible study uh, from the New Hope Baptist Church here in Covington, Georgia. We greet you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I hope you had a great day today and uh, certainly praying and hoping that things are going well at your house. We're back again. We've been off for uh, a little while doing some various things last week. We were uh, last couple of weeks. We were off, but we're back again tonight and uh, we're happy to be back to share with you again. Have an exciting uh, lesson for you tonight. We're going to be talking about the story of the Gibbonites, the story of the Gibbonites. We're going to be talking about um, uh, covenants and generational curses, covenants and generational curses. In the meantime, I want to remind you that we're back again tonight, and we also will be back tomorrow night with our call-in prayer line. And so we want to encourage you to uh, be prepared to call in tomorrow night for the prayer line. That's the New Hope Baptist Church prayer line. That's tomorrow night from 8 p.m. till 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the number to call is 774-220-4020. Again, that's 774-220-4020. Access code is 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. Uh, we're going to be praying tonight. As we pray tonight, we're going to remember, we need to remember uh, Reverend Lance Harris. He was involved in an automobile accident a few days ago, kind of sore. And uh, so we just keep him lifted up in our prayers. I believe he's on the way back home to Maryland at this time. And uh, so we'd be praying that he'll have safe travel. That's uh, Reverend Lance Harris and family. Also, actually, pray for my darling, lovely wife, Dr. Margie Miller. She's not, uh, she's having some issues with uh, uh, low potassium and things like that. So she's getting checked out even now as we speak at the hospital. So we just lift her up in our prayers. Uh, praying for Brother Julian Epps. Brother Julian Epps, Brother Brandon's uh, son. He's having some issues with his blood pressure. And so he's in Rockdale uh, getting checked out for that. So we lifting him up in our prayers. Also praying for our uh, Deacon Robert Clark. Deacon Robert Clark was having some issues, had a bout with pneumonia. And so he's recovering from that. But nevertheless, God is a healer. The God we serve is a healer. And so we're praying for his healing power. We're also praying for all those families that will stand around in the graveside uh, to bid a loved one goodbye. Uh, we're still lifting up uh, Sister um, Shirley Clements as they still deal with the passing of uh, Brother Marvin, and so many more who will, uh, even this weekend, tomorrow even, stand around the graveside and say goodbye to a loved one. We pray that God will just comfort them as only he can. Let's go now to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come now in the name of Jesus and we come and thank you, God, for this another day, we thank you, God, for this chance and this opportunity to come one more time and just share your word. We're grateful for this privilege. We're grateful for this opportunity. We're grateful for this medium of Facebook and YouTube. And we pray, God, that as this lesson go forth, for it'll be a blessing to those who are viewing it live and those who will see it later on, that your word will do what you have sent it to do. Father, we lift up those who are on our prayer list. We lift up Dr. Miller. We lift up Deacon Clark. We lift up Brother Julian. We lift up Reverend Lance. And God, there's so many others that stand in need of prayer. As we said earlier, God, you are the great physician. And so we're trusting in you. You have more medicine in the hem of your garment than all the doctors in the whole wide world. And so we believe it done. Through the power of your name, we believe it done in Jesus' name. 
Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. As we said earlier, tonight we're going to be talking about the story of the Gibeonites. Story of the Gibeonites, covenants and generational curses. I ran across this story some time ago, and it's always been fascinating to me. And uh, I've been wanting to share it, and so the Lord just allowed me uh, to just uh, share it this time. And so I want us to... Uh, to look at it. Uh, the story of the Gibbonites. And we're going to be talking about covenants and generational curses. The story of the Gibbonites. Covenants and generational curses. All right. There was a time when I did not believe in generational curses. It's a time of ignorance. I had not uh, read very much on on that in the Bible. I've heard people talk about it. Uh, but they talked about it uh, in the sense that there was, you know, something going on with the family, and it was just habits or proclivities passed down. But the Bible talks about the fact that there are indeed generational curses. And the story of the Gibbonites is, is one that uh, just illustrates that point. One that illustrates that point. And so I want us to look at that tonight. We're going to start off and uh, as we as we go through this and, and while I'm talking, you know, the wife and I, the wife and I were talking earlier, and she said this may be one that uh, you may have to go slow on. Uh, it may because you may have to do it in two parts, and and yes, I agree. Uh, so we may not, we may not finish tonight, and if we don't, we'll we'll do a part two. But I want to start. With uh, Second Samuel, chapter twenty-one, and it's uh, in Second Samuel chapter twenty-one, we have a curious thing going on. Now let's just read verse one. It says, "Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David sought the face of the Lord again." As I said earlier, you see the Lord there is in all caps, L-O-R-D. Uh, David sought the face of Yahweh. And Yahweh said, the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. Now, here's the thing I want us to notice. At the time this is happening, Saul is dead. David is king. So this famine that David and Israel was enduring was not because of anything wrong David or Israel had done. Think about that. They were suffering. They were enduring a three-year famine because of something Saul had done. 
in the previous generation. I just want to let let I just want to let that sink in. David and Israel were suffering as a direct consequence of something Saul had done. Saul dead by now. But something Saul had done in his lifetime. David and Israel were suffering because of something that somebody in the previous generation had done. See, Saul's killing of the Gibeonites, and check this out, Saul's killing of the Gibeonites was a violation of a covenant that Joshua in Israel had made. And this covenant had been made hundreds of years before Saul was born. <laughs> but Saul's killing of the Gibeonites was a violation of the covenant of a covenant Joshua and Israel had made with the Gibeonites generations before Saul was born. So, so I want you to get this picture. David and Israel are suffering because of a violation of a covenant that had been made hundreds of years before they were born. Generations before they were born. Saul broke a covenant that was made generations before he was born. David and Israel were suffering because of a covenant that was broken a generation before they came along. My point is, it could be that some of the things we are suffering, some of the adverse effects that are taking place in our lives could very well have nothing to do with us personally. It could be because of something that happened, some violation, some uh, uh, mishap, some sin of our fathers, grandfathers, maybe even great-grandfathers. See, sometimes we we fail to understand. I mean, we can we can readily accept the fact of blessings being passed down through generations. But just as blessings are passed down through generations, so can curses. So can a curse be passed down through generations. You can't have one without the other. So, so look at it. This, this goes from Joshua all the way down to David. There was a covenant made with the Gibeonites, and we're going to go over that in a minute. But this covenant was made, we found a record of it, in Joshua chapter 9, uh, that whole chapter, verses 1 through 27, that whole chapter, that's, that's generation 8. That's, that's, that's the first generation. Then we got a generation after that, the period of the judges. Remember, Joshua died. And after Joshua died, there was no real um, strong leader. And so we have a period of judges who, who, who God raised up in various uh, locations. Okay. And then after that, Israel uh, clamors for a king. And so that's when Saul comes along. So that's the third generation. Saul is the third generation after the covenant that was made. 
And then you have David in Israel suffers from Saul's actions, something Saul did during his lifetime. You got to remember now, Saul's, Saul's reign as king was, was fairly short, about two to three years before Saul, Saul was rejected. So within a two, three year period, Saul did something. He, 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 in his zeal, he went, to, he went to war and he killed the Gibeonites, some of the Gibeonites, which was a direct uh, violation of the covenant that was made during Joshua's days. And as a result of that, David and his generation suffers because of something Saul did. And then, we're gonna, you know, after that, uh, David wants to make retribution. And the Gibeonites has sent us seven of Saul's sons that we may hang them. And so seven of Saul's sons suffer from Saul's actions. We find that um, in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 2 through 9. And that's part of generation 5, and, I mean generation 4, and probably on to generation 5. Uh, because they're, they're, the children they had, or the children they would have had, suffered because of their deaths. So what am I saying? I, I'm saying two things, first of all. I'm saying as I said earlier, that it could be, could very well be uh, that some of the some of the stuff we're going through in our lives may not necessarily be suffering for Christ. It may not necessarily be the devil just attacking us for us, but it could very well be the result of something our parents or grandparents did. Now, now I know. Uh, it talked about who did sin, this man, sin or his parents. Jesus said in that particular case that it was not because of something his parents had done, but, but that the glory of God may be manifested to him. But that was not a blank statement that applied to everybody. So I'm saying that, and I'm also saying that what you and I do can have repercussions for generations to come. So let's look at the Gibeonite covenant. We find it in, um, in uh, Joshua chapter one, whole chapter 27 uh, verses. But I mean, this, this first slide here is the first 15 verses. It says, as soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Pezzarites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jesubites heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done at Jericho to Jericho and Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks from their donkeys and wineskin, worn out and torn and mended with worn out parched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes and all their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgad and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country. So now make a covenant with us. In other words, they're saying, we're not part of the group you're supposed to be destroying. We're not from here. We, we, we come from a distant country. So make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, perhaps you live among us. Then how can we make a covenant with you? So the Lord had told them uh, to go in and to destroy uh, all the people who were in the land. And so the Hivites, I mean, the, the, the Gibeonites are pretending they don't live in the land. They pretend they come from a far distance and they heard what Joshua was doing. And so they travel all that distance uh, to make a covenant with him. So, but the men of Israel said to the Hivites, 
perhaps you live among us. Uh, how Then how can we make a covenant with you? And they said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you? And where do you come from? And they said to him, from a very distant country, your servants have come. Because of the name of the Lord your God, the name of Yahweh your God, for we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did uh, to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who lived with in Astaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here's our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we set out to come to you. But now, behold, it is dry and crumbling. These wineskins were new when we filled them, and behold, they have, they have burst. And these garments and sanders of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. Continue on. Verse 16. At the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now the cities were Gibeon, Shepharah, Chif Berah, and Karath Jerem. But the people of Israel did not attack them. Notice I have this in red. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, by Yahweh, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation, that is the congregation of Israel, murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them, let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. And the leader said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation. Just as the leaders had said of them, Joshua summoned them and he said to them, why did you, see, why did you deceive us? Saying we are very far from you when you dwelt among us. Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood, and drawers of waters, water for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because you and because of you and, and did this thing. And now, behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So we did this to them and delivered them of the hand uh, uh, of the people of Israel. And they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day and the place that he should choose. Now let's let's break this down, uh, some finer, finer points. Let's break this down. Notice that God had instructed Joshua to destroy all the inhabitants of the land. And when the Gibeonites heard this, 
Now, now, now some of the other ones that joined together was going to go to war. But the Gibbonites said, well, hey, you know, we 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 got to find a way to survive. So so they put on a farce. They, they acted like they pretended they were from a far country when actually they were in, they were within three days' journey. And so they 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 tricked them. That's the bottom line. They they tricked them. But they would they devised a plan to save their lives. Now, this covenant was expressly that the covenant the people made with the Gibbonites was expressly forbidden by the Lord. I'm just going to read Exodus chapter uh, 23 and verse 32. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 32. Uh, because they were forbidden to make covenants with any people in the land. Because God didn't want them uh, to make covenants with them. He said, thou shalt make no covenant with them. Nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. Okay? Let's flip over to verse uh, chapter 34. Verse 12. He says, take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. And thou shalt not, and thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. Now, let me just say this. And this is one also the one of the reasons why uh, God was against uh, the marrying people of the land. It, it has nothing. It had nothing to do with race. It was not a racial issue. It was a religious issue. God didn't want them intermarrying because their wives would influence them to serve other gods, which is eventually what happened with Solomon. See, so it wasn't a racial thing. It was a religious thing. So this covenant was forbidden, but they were tricked. They were tricked. Now, here's the thing. Even though Joshua and Israel were tricked into making an expressly forbidden covenant, they were still bound by that covenant. Now, here's a problem. They did not consult the Lord. That's what it says in Joshua 4, uh, 9, 14. It says, so these men took their some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. That's a very important scripture. Because you're gonna if you're gonna enter in covenant in a covenant relationship, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later on, the various covenant relationships we make sometimes. It is in and, and, and we, we're not just talking about marriage. Well, whatever covenant relationship you get involved in, you should ask the Lord, is, is this something that he would approve of? Is this something that, that's, that, that does not violate your covenant with him? Because he says, thou shall have no other God before me. That word before in the Hebrew is not just in front of, it's not just uh, 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 first. It means in addition to, and it also means even in his presence. 
Thou shalt have no other God. So let's look and see what a covenant is. Uh, a covenant is a sacred kinship bond between two parties that's ratified by swearing an oath. Again, a covenant is a sacred kinship bond between two parties that is ratified by swearing an oath. I raise my right hand. You place your hand on the Bible. You kneel at an altar. All those are signs of making a covenant. The oath is usually it, the oath usually invokes the name of a deity. The oath also usually involves a blood sacrifice. Usually with oaths, with, with making covenants, rather, covenants involve a blood sacrifice. In covenants, also there is a ritual, there are cultic rites, there is a ceremony. There's a ceremony. Many times it involves the sharing of a meal, common meal. Now here's the thing. Covenants are legally binding in the spiritual realm. And I think one of the things that many uh, modern Christians don't realize, don't know that much about, is that uh, there are some spiritual legalities. See, sometimes when we we give we give we give the enemy legal grounds to harass us, legal grounds to accuse us. Legal grounds to have access in our lives. And ignorance of the law, ignorance of the legalities is no excuse. The Bible says, says in Hosea, I believe it's Hosea, he says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. And we're living in a time now where, 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 where people are perishing. People of God are perishing left and right. Not because God doesn't want to bless them. Not because they're not being blessed. But many times, oftentimes, they're perishing because they don't know and they're ignorant of the legalities of the kingdom of God. They're ignorant of how the laws, how laws work in the spiritual realm. So all these are involved in covenants. It's a sacred bond between two parties ratified by the swearing of an oath. Anytime there's an oath involved, you raise your hand, you place your hand on the Bible or some other sacred book, you bow on the altar. That's a divine covenant. And all divine covenants are not covenants with Yahweh, the most high God, there are covenants we can make with other gods, even today. I know, I know people think that there are no other gods. There are, you know. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If if God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and if there are no other gods, then what is God talking about? In the Psalms, it talks about how great he is among the gods. Or if there are no, if there are no other gods, then he's great among nothing. That doesn't make sense. And if we were to read our Bibles carefully, we would we would discover that the Bible never makes the claim that no other gods exist. The Bible makes the claim that we are to serve only. Yahweh, the most high God. And speaking of the term most high God, how can he be the most high God if there are no less high gods? We live, there is a spiritual world. And I think 
part of the reason I've, I've touched this on the other lessons, uh, but part of the reasons is because of this misunderstanding of the biblical term that's translated as God, Elohim. Elohim, as it is used in the Bible, is not a reference to one particular God. It is a reference to a class of beings, the unembodied, the spiritual realm. The inhabit all of the inhabitants of the spiritual realm are classified as Elohim. It's like it's like saying human. Just like human is a classification, Elohim or God is a classification. Okay? So there are many Elohim. There are many gods, but there's only one supreme God. God is an Elohim, but all Elohims are not the most high God. So and I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying all of this because we're going to discover later on that these gods, these lesser gods, desire worship. And I think we have been tricked in many ways to worship them, not even realizing it. We are idolaters, sometimes ignorantly. Baptism, speaking of covenants, Baptism was understood very early in terms of a covenant oath. I think we take water baptism too lightly. It is a ritual whereby we are being initiated, we're being joined spiritually with the body of Christ. And we break covenant. <laughs> we, we break covenant when we go through the rite of baptism. And yet there's no change in our lives. We make a mockery of baptism. And that's, that is done more often than we care to even talk about. The Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion, is a sacrifice and family meal of the new covenant. That's all about covenant too. When we when we have the Lord's Supper every first Sunday, we are affirming the covenant. So God takes covenants very seriously. And, and therefore, the only covenant that God approves of for believers. The only covenant God approves of, the only covenants God is is the covenant we have with Him, and and we are in covenant relationship with 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 the uh, the Most High God if we are believers, and I think that's a fact that uh, many modern Christians don't understand or appreciate. God did not save us. For us to be independent agents doing our own thing. No, God saved us. And part of that salvation, part of our salvation, that what undergirds and what holds our salvation, we are in covenant relationship. And when we have a covenant, that means we have responsibilities. We have obligations. Just as God has responsibilities and obligations in the covenant. But here's the deal. Uh, people want to be saved, uh, but they, they're ignorant of and they don't want to perform or they don't want to be obligated to their covenant obligations. But if you break the covenant, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not in an agreement. You're in rebellion. You're against God. And that's a very, very precarious place to be. So God takes covenants very seriously. Therefore, the only covenants God approves for believers is a covenant between God and the believer and 
the covenant of biblical marriage. And what I mean by biblical marriage, I mean marriage as God designed it, as God invented it, as God intended it, marriage between one man and one woman. I know we have alternative marriages these days. People are getting, uh, Sally's marrying Sue and John is marrying Joe. Uh, but that's that those marriages are not marriages according to God's original plan for marriage. He intended for marriage to be between a man and a woman. Now, you can have unions, but uh, they're not necessarily marriages, biblically speaking. And I know there are people who will, who will disagree, uh, but I'm just going by what the word says. So let's look at some questionable covenants. And uh, I know this will not be very popular with some people. Uh, but uh, it is what it is. You see, when you joined, when you were in college, and you join a fraternity or a sorority, that was a covenant relationship. So they are fraternal and sorority covenants. Covenants between believers and unbelievers. And no oath or covenant is in, inconsequential. Uh, I've talked to some people and they said, well, you know, we, that we, we were just saying something. That's just part of the ritual. It wasn't no big deal. No. No. In the spirit realm, your words mean something. In fact, Jesus said that one day we're going to have to give an account of every idle word we speak. So, if the words didn't mean anything, why would you say them? If you didn't mean what you're saying, why why'd you say it? If it was just part of the ritual, no big deal, then why go through it? Can't have it both ways. And even, listen, even if an oath or a covenant is made under duress or ignorance, it is still binding. And I know a lot of people, a lot of Christians have joined fraternities, have joined uh, Masonic organizations, and perhaps were really ignorant as to what they were doing. But nevertheless, you are yoked. And your ignorance is no excuse. You're still bound. And we've already talked about uh uh, Joshua, you know, they, they were tricked, but nevertheless, their oath, their covenant was still binding. Let's look at uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 17. This is one that was made under duress. Ezekiel chapter 17. This was a covenant made under duress, but nevertheless, it was still binding, and the Lord honored it. Ezekiel chapter 17, let's start at verse 11. He said, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon, and had taken of the king's seed, and made a covenant with him, okay, king's sons, made a covenant with him, and had taken an oath of him, and he had taken the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be based, or brought low, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping his covenant, it might stand. In other words, he's saying that, that Babylon came, and when they besieged Judah, 
they made a covenant and Judah was not to rebel. And, uh, you know, if, if they had not rebelled, then Babylon would have spared them. But we're going to find out something else happened. Verse 15, but he, that is the king. But he rebelled against him, the king of Babylon, the king of Israel, rebelled, the king of Judah, rather, rebelled against Babylon by sending his ambassadors to Egypt. He went, he, he appealed to Egypt for help. That he might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape? He to do such thing, or shall he break the covenant? Here it is. And shall he break the covenant and be delivered? As I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, even with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Neither shall Pharaoh with his ar mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant. When lo, he has given his hand and has done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath that he hath despised and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. And I will spread my net upon him and he shall be taken by in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon and will plead with him there for his trespass that he has trespassed against me and all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword and they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds and you shall know that I the Lord have spoken it in other words what Yahweh was saying, the king of Judah made a covenant with Babylon, but he broke that covenant. He rebelled by appealing to Egypt for help. And God looked at that as, as breaking a covenant with him because God was working through this because he had prophesied through the prophets that if they did not repent, that they would be taken into captivity. They did not repent. They're taken into captivity. Okay? And so what the king of Judah was trying to do is he was trying to rebel against that, rebel against the prophetic word of the Lord by rebelling against Babylon, appealing to Egypt. And God said that was that's not going to work. And because of that, the Babylonians came in, utterly destroyed them, took off the mighty, took them to Babylon, and the king of Judah died in Babylon as a result of him breaking his covenant. So covenants are important. And in the spiritual realm, whether this covenant is of God or not, whether it's of Yahweh or not, when you break a covenant, you will reap consequences for breaking that covenant. God honors covenant. We just read this. Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 11 through 21. God honors covenants. Even the covenants that are not made with him. So, there's some, there's some secular covenants in the Bible. There are some covenants in Scripture in, in the ancient Near East uh, are called secular. These are, these are the covenants made between human parties apart from divine interventions. It says a number of secular covenants between two human parties are recorded in the Bible. It talks about uh, the covenant between Abraham and, uh, and Abimelech. That's in Genesis chapter 21. Verses 23 through 33. Isaac and Abimelech. And you can read those at your leisure. Leisure, uh, Genesis 26 through 33. Jacob and Laban. The 
the Israelites, we just read that one, the Israelites and the Gibeonites, David and Jonathan, Ahab and Benadad, uh, Jehoka, Jehoda and the palace guards and others. These secular covenants testify of the widespread use of covenants to extend sacred kinship bonds in ancient society. Here I have it, here it is, I have it in red. Even these secular covenants forge bonds of sacred kinship that could not be broken without triggering curses. Even when covenants were established under false pretense or under duress. That one in Joshua 9, we just read it, which is the main one we're talking about today. That was a covenant that, that the people of Israel made with the Gibeonites, but they made it under false pretense. The Gibeonites tricked them. They deceived them into making that covenant. Nevertheless, that covenant was binding. In Ezekiel, the king was forced. He was manipulated. He was he was hammered into making that covenant with Babylon. Nevertheless, that covenant was binding. And when you break a covenant, whether it's made, the covenant is made in ignorance, whether you're tricked into it, or whether you're forced into it, the consequence of breaking that covenant is, is a curse. Because the covenant is a legal binding agreement in the spiritual realm. And to break a covenant, you will suffer consequences. So, what are the consequences? Covenant breaking. When you break a covenant, you in, and it's usually stipulated in, in the covenant, the blessings and the cursings. We, we see this a classic example of this is found in Deuteronomy 28, where Moses rehearses before the people. You know, he had he had he had he had some some groups stay on one mountain, get on one mountain to pronounce the blessings. He had another group of people get on another mountain to uh 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 proclaim the curses. So every covenant has blessings for obedience, cursing for disobedience. So cursing relates to divine, to binding utterances, a negative and, and damaging connotation. It can convey a declaration of, a wish for, or realization of judgment from God. It is associated with binding oaths and can refer to demeaning and harmful speech directed from one person to another. Now, as a side note, I want you to notice that there is a difference between cussing, when you use bad language, that's cussing, and cursing. Cussing involves the use of foul and unwholesome language, while cursing involves negative, non-productive, and often and sometimes counterproductive proclamation and speech or the result of breaking a covenant. Now, ironically, there are many believers who would not dare cuss, but they routinely curse. I hope you got that. There are many believers who would not dare cuss, but they routinely curse. What am I talking about? Well, you bring cursing in your life when you don't speak faith-filled words. When you speak your fears instead of your faith. Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. Yes, the words you speak are powerful. You see, we were made 
Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that we were made in the image and likeness of God. We were made to administrate the kingdom of God on earth in the physical realm. So we were made to operate on earth similar to a manner that God operates in heaven. We were made to operate in the physical realm in a manner, in the same manner that God operates in the spiritual realm. Now, what does that have to do with what I was talking about? Well, listen, how did God create the world? If you read the, the biblical text, we read over and over and over again, and God said, and God said, the physical world came to existence by the word of God. To a certain extent, we we create, we recreate our worlds by our spoken word. So you need to be careful what you say. Discipline yourself to only say what you mean and to only mean and to always mean what you say. Don't I Words are just things that we are too careless with. We're too careless with our words. And Jesus said that one day we'll have to give an account of every idle word we speak. Be careful with your words. Your words have creative power. Now, you can't create you can't create something out of nothing with your words. Only God can do that. We cannot call those things which be not as though they were. No, that's that's that only only God can do that. But what we can do is we can rearrange, we can recreate what's already been created. In other words, we can't make the furniture with our words. Only God can make the furniture, but we can rearrange the furniture with our words. So be careful. Make, make from now on, resolve to make your words work for you instead of working against you. Be careful with your words because oftentimes uh we curse our lives and sometimes ignorantly unknowingly we curse we curse our own lives with our lips by speaking unadvised ill-advisedly by speaking foolishly because there are no jokes in the spiritual realm you know how people say so well, you know, I didn't mean that. I'm just kidding. There are no jokes in the spiritual realm. Because just as, 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 as the angels were attentive to the words of God, angels are attentive to our words. And a lot of times we don't get what we want in life. Here's your homework. Tomorrow, I just want you to go up to somebody that you know just randomly ask them, what do you want? And I can almost guarantee you that if you ask 10 people what they want, nine of those 10 people are going to start off telling you what they don't want. They're going to answer a question that you didn't ask. You didn't ask them what they, you're not going to ask them what they don't want. You're going to ask them what they want, but they're going to talk about what they don't want. Because we've been programmed. See, that's why our minds need to be renewed with the word of God. Because so often 
Instead of saying what we want, we say what we don't want. And we inadvertently bring cursings upon our lives by the words we speak. And in the lives of others. And that's one form of cursing. But we're going to get back to uh, the other form of cursing. And I don't want to hold you too long. So I'm going to I'm going to re preface, re relabel uh, this lesson tonight as just part one. And we're going to continue with the other part uh, next week, the Lord's willing, when we uh, meet again. All right. Well, God bless you, my friend. I pray and hope. Uh, that that's been a blessing to you, the, the part we went over. Uh, we're going to start uh, at this point, Lord's willing, and continue and finish uh, next week. Amen. Well, listen, if this has been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to someone else. So I want you, I want to encourage you to share it on your timeline. Till the next time, may the Lord bless you real good is our prayer.